up. Yes, you have to. Come on. His birthday was yesterday. I don't think he was 57, though. 37? Come on, come on up the steps over here. Her birthday was Tuesday? Okay, well, I'm not going to say anything about that. So, Tuesday was your birthday. Yesterday was your birthday. Yesterday was hers. Anybody else have a birthday or an anniversary we need to celebrate? Is your birthday? Is it your birthday? No? He's just wanting everybody to know that he's five. Okay. All right. Well, we're, hey, congratulations on that. All right. Anybody? And you look handsome. That's your handsome shirt. I know it is. I like it. Uh, oh, okay. And he is from Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. He and his family are joining us. Do we have any other special days, birthdays, anniversaries, anybody? Anybody? I can't hear you because of the fans, so you're going to have to raise your hand or wave at me or something. Come on, guys. Out them. You know who they are. Out them. Don't let them do that. So the Germans have shown up. <laughs> They've invaded my stage. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> Your anniversary? Yeah. How, how many years? 26. 26? When? <laughs> when? What day? Wednesday. This coming Wednesday? Last, Wednesday? Last Wednesday. So they're celebrating 26 years. So when they're a great asset to this congregation, we love them very much. So. Anyone else? So Nathaniel is not here. Whatever shall we do? Happy anniversary. There we go. You. you are the man. Do it. No, I'm not kidding. You do it. All right. Happy anniversary. Wait, are there any birthday on this? Yes, your mother's. <laughs> Start over. Start over. Start over. It was a dad joke. <laughs> okay. Pay no attention to that man behind the wall. Are you ready? All right. Happy birthday to you. Happy anniversary, happy birthday, happy birthday. I apologize for that. <laughs> so, all right. All right, here. I was trying to not bring All righty, so um, once again, what we're gonna do, um, we're gonna divide up into classes, and then about 4.30, the classes are gonna dis, uh, 4.45, I'm sorry. About 4.45, guys, the classes are going to go ahead and dismiss. We're going to come down at about 4.45. We're going to let you take a little break because the idea is for those who remain, for those who are alive and remain, um, <laughs> about 5 o'clock we're going to have a, uh, an abbreviated Rosh Chodesh service because tonight begins Rosh Chodesh Elul. So we want to kind of get back into the groove of having our new moon services, all right? So, um, I'm looking for, all right, Miss Nayla, who's going with you? The, 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 these? Okay. So we want, all right, these to go first? Okay. So follow Miss Katie. If you're four, five, or six, is that right? Four, five, or six, you're going to follow Miss Katie upstairs. Okay. 
Four, five, or six. Miss Katie, about 445, okay? All righty. Now, Nayla, are you ready? All right, seven, eight, and nine, you're going to follow Miss Nayla. Seven, eight, and nine, you're going to follow Miss Nayla. All right, Junior Quiver, 10 through 13. General Pernax over here by this door. We want you to rally around him over here. We're going to have to knock out some walls to make room for his class or something. That's a lot of kids. Oh, young people, pardon me. All right, senior quiver. Join General Dahl over here by this door. Okay, so I think we're good now. Is everybody okay? Everybody doing all right? Hanging in there? All right. Um, so I'm going to need, who's going to carry the mic today? Nate, are you going to carry the mic today? Thank you, sir. All right. So we'll go ahead and get started. So if anybody has any Oh, let me say this. Thank you. I appreciate that. Let me say this. Um, we typically, uh, during the Rosh Chodesh service, we'll give you an opportunity if you have any prayer requests that are written um, to deposit them in this little receptacle right here. So if you have a prayer request, I think in the backs of the chairs, there should be little forms there. So if you have a written prayer request, oh, they're all here. Okay. So if you have a written prayer request, if you want to put that in when we have our Rosh Chodesh service, you can. Um, we're going to give you an opportunity to do that because a lot of people, some people don't like to uh, share everything publicly, and we understand that. So we want to make sure you have an opportunity for that. So let's go ahead and begin. And so if we, yes, sir, Robert. Now, uh, one other thing, let me, let me tell you, the fans... You know, up here it's kind of a little harder for me to hear, so you need to hold that microphone right up to your mouth. Don't, don't put your mouth on it, but, but hold it close to your mouth so I can hear. All right, so this is uh, actually, I, I love this part. I was talking to Mike about it this morning. Um, I try to live my life in a balance. My whole life has been about trying to seek balance and everything. And this Parsha starts off with looking at two mountains and thinking about that every morning they get up, they have a choice to make what path they're going to walk. Are they going to walk toward evil? Are they going to walk toward good? They're going to walk down the middle. What are they going to do? They have to make that choice every morning on how are you going to walk your walk. So you go all the way through the Parsha and at the end of the Parsha, it tells us that three times a year uh, you're to present yourself in front of 
in Jerusalem to be seen or to see and be seen. So we talk a lot about humility and a lot about, you know, make sure you point to the Father. And here we're being told to present ourselves, one, to be seen, but also to see, or to backwards, to see and also be seen. Again, you need to walk your walk correctly hmm. because you are to be seen doing, doing what you're told, not just talking about it. Amen. Good observation. I like that. Because people will be watching. Can you bring them up a little in my monitor, please? Yes, Jenna. Hello. Good evening. Hello. Good afternoon. Um, I have a question about um, something that um, penetrated my heart this morning. I've been thinking a lot about the um, passage where you honor your father and your mother. And something happened at work that made me think, um, because I try to try know all of my, the kids that I work with, their story. And it seems to me, and I want to see if I'm on the right track, it kind of occurred to me today that the kids who do not have good relationships with their mom and their dad, and they don't honor their mom and their dad, because they just don't think they have to, um, that they're also the same children who um, balk against authority, that they don't have any respect for authority figures. And I thought about when I was walking through the house, I was thinking, how is this biblical? You know, am I thinking the wrong way? Um, so I figured I'd ask you. And the passage where it says that um, God will bring the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, I thought, well, that's got to do with kids. But I thought about, as I was thinking about that, I thought how, um, as God moved John and I here, um, and how God used um, Tennessee, and then consequently Jacob's tent to heal my heart, um, I realized that it is in the facet of relationship, the facet of family, because you and Beth have become our family um, and how that's healed our hearts. And I thought how these kids aren't honoring their mom and their dad, how that would tear apart the family. And I don't know if I'm making any sense, but it feels to me like God is all about family and with um, this fellowship. I think that's what we all are looking for is because you have very specifically stated that you want to keep it about family and about relationship and i truly treasure that i think that brings healing not to just us but to everyone and i think that is the draw to the father and into and, and to jacob's tent but am i right like is it like the lack of honoring your father and your mother is that the the whole uprising like these children nowadays they don't honor their mom and their father but now they want to get rid of the policemen they like any kind of authority. Am I right or am I just off? Well, I think they're connected, yeah. It's not necessarily that it's across the board the same, you know, situation. Um, I mean, look at Cain and Abel, you know, or look at Adam for that matter. He had the perfect father, but he still decided to rebel. So it's not a, uh, it's not that it's exclusively that because they have no respect for mom and dad that they rebel against other authority. But I do believe that, well, I believe that rebellion is conceived in, at home. I guess I, I'll put it that way, you know? And um, you, can, you can have two basic scenarios. You can have a, a family, a parents do everything they're supposed to do, train them right, you know, guide them right, give them a good example, and they can still go off and do what they want to do, okay? Um, and then, you know, but there are sometimes parents create an environment that does kind of foster rebellion, which they have no respect for the parents, and then they go out and they rebel against everything else. Um, as far as Well, I guess it's going to be hard for them to have respect for, you know, civil authority if they don't have any respect for parental authority. 
Okay. So what is the, what caused that? You know, who knows? Could be a number of things. But because family is so important, you know, if families were stronger, as they need to be, I do think that it would reduce the amount of rebellion that we see evident in the street. It wouldn't necessarily eliminate it, but it would certainly help, you know, help with the problem. The reason that we have, the reason our schools are war zones is because there are no boundaries. And the government in their almighty wisdom have, you know, stepped in and said, well, we'll just take prayer out of school, you know, and they removed that restraining factor and now everything's gone crazy. So when there are no boundaries, there are no rules, whether that's in a school, whether that's in a home, or whether that's in the streets, you're going to have rebellion. You're going to have anarchy. You're going to have lawlessness. So everything we can do as families to counter that, you know, to establish firm boundaries, to, uh, yeah, I'll use that word, demand respect. You may not like the rule, but you're, going, you're living here. You're going to have to live by the rule, you know? Um, I, I think that that is very important for us to do. So as a, congreg as a congregation, you know, the reason we want to keep it a family is because, you know, the very first thing that the Creator does is He establishes, you know, a man and a woman, they come together, they produce offspring, they produce a family, you know, and, and, and that's the way it's supposed to be. So. Um, and maybe I don't make any sense now. I feel like I'm rambling around. But the point I'm trying to get across is that family is very important. And that's why the adversary wants to do everything he can to destroy it. Whether it's my family, your family, that family, this family, he wants to do everything he can do to undermine it and destroy it. Because a good, solid family is a restraining factor when it comes to all the, the lawlessness of this world. Okay, did that make any sense? Okay. So in that, let me say that, um, let me say this, that this comment that you made as far as the family aspect of things being an attraction, I am convinced that most people that want to be part of this congregation, it's not because of the teaching, it's not because of the music, it's not because of, uh, you know, any specific element other than I think more than anything else, people want to be part of a family. They want to be part of a community. They want to be part of a people who they know they have my back, you know, and they're going to help me when I need help. They're going to encourage me when I need to be encouraged. So, and that's why we want it to be a family kind of feel and atmosphere, because that's what's needed, all right? We don't want another church, all right? Who's, who's next? Who's got the mic? Nobody has the mic. All right, well, oh, there's a hand over here. Oh. All right, Isaac, go ahead. Uh, yeah, blessings, everyone. Um, I just, uh, it came to my mind, right? And, and because of lawlessness abounding, the love of many will grow cold, right? So we're seeing that being fulfilled um, in our days, right? And uh, so last week's Torah portion, the highlight for me was the Lord brought us into the desert to test, right? He brought them out to the desert to test them. And I had quite a week last, uh, not this past week, previous week, right? Tor previous Torah portion, a week uh, at work. And I was like, the Lord's bringing me in this season to test. That's kind of what jumped out at me. And to give him the praise, to acknowledge him in my life. And this week's Torah portion was choosing life or death, blessings or cursing. And this past week has been nothing but blessings for me and for my family. Um, just a week the father made, uh, he turned the, the week prior, which was struggles and testing, and this week was blessings. So I just wanted to share that with everyone. It's been nothing but blessings arriving here. We came here by faith, we left a lot, back in Egypt, uh, Massachusetts, where we came from. And the Lord, he's been blessing us, uh, finding this congregation. Uh, Bill, yourself, Beth, uh, all our brothers and sisters that we've met here have been nothing but blessings to our lives. So praise the Father, praise Yah for that. Well, amen. You guys have been a blessing to us. 
Is Dennis and uh, Helga still here? They're not here? Okay. Another Massachusetts couple. I thought y'all would just should meet, so. And of course, Harry's from Boston. Oh, you have you already met? Well, hey, Isaac, Harry. Harry, Isaac. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who, okay, Brian. Shalom, Bill. Shalom. Um, I had a few observations. Hold I'm that sorry. Mark yeah, a little I closer. Thank them. you. I got a few observations and then a, a few questions. A few questions. Okay. No. Well, <laughs> I don't know. We'll see where it goes. <laughs> Eleven twenty-two. That's from the last uh, portion. Um, that verse just has been really. I've had an aha moment with it um, this last week. For if you diligently guard all these commands which I command you to do, and to love Yod Vave your Elohim, and to walk in all his ways, and to cling to him. And I like this version that I'm reading from here. Um, There's a couple of things. I wanted to thank you for the letter um, for uh, the exemption on Shabbat at work. Um, Did it work? It was good. Okay. Yes. Um, it, it was, I guess, the final thing that they needed because I've been going for a month <clears throat> waiting, <clears throat> waiting to see what would transpire. But yes, thank you. Um, it stirred up conversation with the guys that I'm with. I love Tennessee because there's so many Bible-fearing people and they were raised with the Bible. So, you know, they're kind of wondering, you know, what's going on with me. And this one fella really has stepped up and we greet each other Boker Tove now because he's really interested in things, you know. And he's from Tennessee? Yes, yeah, Oak Ridge I'm working up at. Oh, yeah, so, so does it sound kind of like Boker Tove or something? Yeah, like yeah, that? Okay. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I was realizing the paradigm that's taken place in my life is when I read that, for if I diligently guard all these commands, which I'm commanded to do, and to love my Elohim, and to walk in all his ways and to cling to him, it just becomes so personalized I, I just I love the phases you go through as you're walking through Torah and I realize they still look at it as children of Israel you do this you do that you do that and then you'll be blessed not ever realizing that if I do this and I do that and I'm gonna be blessed and it dawned on me this morning as you were talking that We've always lived on one income, um, and the Lord's always provided, but that's not the norm nowadays. And we've never been lacking. We've built new homes. We've always owned property. And my family just doesn't understand our ways. But I realized when I was walking I would say more in Christianity, if you want to use the term, I don't, you know. I, I got you. Yeah. So they did follow Torah from the standpoint of tithing. And they, they made it through, and I, I made it through. I, I made it through. I always tithe, and I, I felt I was always blessed because I was honoring that small portion of the word that <laughs> I was told I needed to. But now that I'm walking in all the Torah these last seven years, my paycheck's going right into savings. I mean, he's just abundantly in the midst of COVID, in the midst of inflation. It just astounds me. It just astounds me. I got brothers and sisters that are professionals and they got two family incomes and they seem to stay paycheck to paycheck. So anyway, I, I just wanted to throw that out there. But breaking down this verse, okay, you shall love yod heh your Elohim. Did you know the Alef Tav is before the yod heh -Vave? I'm looking at it right here. And also verses 1 and verses 13, I think it is. Same thing. And I'm, I'm, I didn't do a big search. I didn't have time to. But 
Again, where are you with the Isle of Tav? Where am I? Yeah, uh, in your your. Well, I mean, how 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 detailed do you want what me did, to get here? Well, Yeshua, right? Well, Olive Tov's the first and last Hebrew letters, right? So mm -hmm. he didn't. He doesn't say I'm the Alpha and Omega. He, he more likely says I'm the Olive the Tov. But what is the Olive and Tov? What I mean, grammatically, it serves as a sign of mm -hmm. something. It's a sign that points to something. Okay, so Yeshua is that that sign, so to speak. Now there are a lot of places it appears in Scripture, and it'll be like it is here. It'll have that little hyphen type mark you know that connects it to the, whatever the next word is but then there are those times it doesn't appear with that um, and and those are the real singular examples but the point being is verse that, one is that way yeah, it doesn't have okay. the connection okay anyway right so the point being is that it is well genesis 1 1 that's where it starts right to it, begin it's a word that isn't translated because it's not a translatable word it is a sign but it is evidence that it was the word of God that stop, created the heavens once, and the earth. I, I got to take that in. It's a sign. I hadn't put that together. I yeah. appreciate that because I know it's not translatable. Hold your mic up. I know it's not translatable, but I like that. Thank you. It's a sign, you know, and it's, you know, I mean, even rabbinical literature comments on the fact that the olive tov is there in Genesis 1-1 and 1 what all that means. And they, they go into explaining how this is, evidence that it was the Word of God that created everything, you know, from the beginning. And so no wonder that John begins his gospel, in the beginning was the Word, the That's Word right was That's right where my God. mind goes and, to, okay. John, yeah. So all of those things are supposed to, well, Yeshua said, and I'll paraphrase, Moses, everything he wrote was about me. Everything was pointing to me. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Passover lamb, the, the blood that was placed upon the door, it shall be as a sign. That word is oat, but it's spelled there in Exodus 12, Aleph Tav. Wow. So that we just have this, you know, repetition of this that tells us this is pointing us to the Messiah. So that's kind of where I stand on it. Perfect, perfect. All right? So when we are to love through the word, through Yeshua, through the sign, Yodhiyavave, our Elohim, That just makes me think of what Yeshua said. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Yeah. And that's what this, there's, it's so reiterated over and over in this portion. There's five times talking about guarding my commandments in that chapter there. Um, in fact, it's, it says when, whenever you see the guard diligently or it's actually the same word twice, right? Samar, Samar or whatever. Sh well, Shamar is the, the root, yeah. The root, yeah. And, and that's one thing, again, learning Hebrew, Hebrew and looking at, at the emphasis, it's saying, guard, guard, you know, it's, right. it's, it's, that's why the translators put it forth as diligently. diligently. It's like, amen and amen. Right. It's emphatic. It's like, pay attention to this. Right. It's, that, that's more the idea rather than the English word we give to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Five times it does say that in, in chapter uh, 11 about um, guard in verse 1, his charge and his laws, his right rulings and his commands always. Verse 8, you shall guard every command I command you today and uh, you will be strong and go in and possess the land and prolong your days. Guard yourselves, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other mighty ones and bow down to them. Um, if you guard diligently all these commands I command you, and love Elohim, and walk in all his ways, and cling to him. And at the very last verse, it starts off and ends, that you shall guard to do all the laws and right rulings that I am setting before you today. I just um, am so glad to have the filter now to read and personalize the uh, relationship that we're called to. It's not a faith that was thousands of years ago. It's us living this out today. Well, even Moses at one point says, these things that I'm telling you are not just for you here today. 
there for people who are not here today. Wow. You know, so he even acknowledges that 3,500 years ago, that he wasn't going to just be speaking to those people. God was using him to speak to future generations. So. If I can just finish up with this question, 12-2, um, completely destroy. Well, that's the same thing. It's the same word, destroy twice. It's emphatic. Destroy all the places where the nations that you dispossess serve their, this one says mighty ones, or it's actually Elohim. Elohim. Yeah, Elohim, the gods. On the high mountains, the hills, and under every green tree. The mighty ones. Um, who are the mighty ones today? Are you asking me, or are you yeah. setting it up to make a comment? Well, I had a thought where it could go to, but... Uh, I thought of like when we were talking or discussing, my wife and I when we were reading the portion, um, you think of like Buddha, is that a mighty one, or Allah? Those are ones put forth and they're not the Elohim of the universe. Well, first of all, let me say this. This instruction is given to the people when they're going into the land of Canaan, the land that he has given them. He didn't tell them to do this when they were in Egypt. He didn't tell them to do it when they were in Babylon or, you know, Assyria. You sound just like your podcast. I did, did listen to your podcast. No, it's great. Right. I'm not really? Saying... Did I say that on a podcast? Yes. Yeah, we're, I listened oh, to okay. it. Oh, okay. Yeah, Good I... to know. <laughs> <laughs> word for word, yeah. Well, but, no, but it, no, it is I'm some... not going there to advocate No, 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 no. I, 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 I'm just saying... For clarification, yes. you know, this is something that he told them to do when they go into that land. He didn't instruct them to do this in any other place. When, when Paul went up to Mars Hill, he didn't stop start pulling down all of their idols. He just found the one that was dedicated to the unknown God and said, "Let me tell you about him." Mm -hmm. You know, my point is that I don't, uh, I don't necessarily relate. Um, this country, I'll just put it that way, is having the same status as the land that God has given to his people, you know, yeah. through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. I am thankful for this land. I do believe that he raised this, this nation up for a purpose, but I don't, I don't put it on the same status as that. I guess what I'm trying to say then is I'm not going to instruct people to go out and start breaking down everybody's Buddhas. Right. Okay? However, don't bring your Buddha into my house. Right. Right? Don't bring your stuff into my house. Don't bring, and as it relates to this house, don't bring that stuff in here. Because we've decided that this is a set-apart space that we're going to worship him. So, back to the question, who are the mighty ones? It's... What is, how does Paul put it? Anything that exalts itself, you know, against the knowledge of the one true God, mm -hmm. you know, that to me would fall into the category of the mighty ones. Those things that people, you know, revere and those things that they esteem that they put above the almighty God, right? I would consider that. So there could be a long, 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 long list of those things. And not just a Buddha, not just an Allah, not just a... Hare Krishna, or whatever, Hare Krishna, or whatever, you mm -hmm. know, but, you know, philosophies, ideologies, you know, political movements, it could be a lot of things, in my view, anyway. Right, yeah. Okay. I just know as for us and our homes, none of that stuff comes None through. of that, that should... That's, that's the land we possess. Right, yeah. that's right. Yeah. I'm not going to go into somebody else's house, tear down their Christmas tree, and throw it out in the street. Yes. Okay. I'm not going to do that. Right. But I'm not, I, there's certain things that in, as far as coming into my house that if I know of it, I'm going to put a stop to it. Amen. Thank you. All right. Do we have anything from the live stream people? Um, Brandon or whoever's back there in the control room? All right. Who has the microphone? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, my name is Daniel. Um, I want to kind of comment on the, the first one about um, the children and the families. This is Ezekiel 18, verse 20. And it's kind of difficult because 
you know, when you have kids, a lot of them sometimes don't go the same direction you want them to go. <laughs> and, really? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's, wow. Yeah. I... It's, you want them, but it doesn't always happen. <laughs> uh, it says, this is verse 20. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The, the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. That to me tells me every generation has their own sins. If I was to bear what my fathers did, that would be kind of difficult, I think. Um, they have a choice. Your children have a choice to either follow and do what their father's doing unto righteousness or not follow. And when we're talking about, you know, following uh, God's word and uh, living, making us to live or to die, we have that choice. And I just want to comment on that because I know, you know, we're talking about the family, she was talking about the family. And I do believe there is something big about having a strong family. I've been married for 28 years and we've had our ups and downs. <laughs> but um, I think knowing that they have their own choices as much as we can go. Even if we are trying to do everything that's the right thing for our children, we just have to kind of let that one be upon them if they decide to choose otherwise. It's difficult, but that's kind of where I'm at. I have a few <laughs> that are struggling. Well, that's why I say you can, as a parent, you can do everything right. You know, I mean, not right, that there's a perfect right. parent, but, but you can do everything exactly the way you're supposed to, and they can still decide to go crazy, you know, so. Right. So, right. yeah, that's, that's kind of on them. Now, I'm going to continue to pray for them, and I'm gonna, we're going to pray that, that God makes their life miserable until they get their act together. Right. Right? Right. Because there were things that were deposited in them. You deposited word in them, right? Right. And we're told that that's never going to leave them. You know, it's not, no matter where they go, they may try to put it out of their mind, but it's never going to leave them. And I very much believe that, you know, the, the Bible talks about how the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I, I really believe that the fervent prayer of a righteous parent avails a lot, you know. And so, anyway, yeah, it's on them. But they're still our children, regardless of how old they are and regardless of what they're doing. And we're still, I believe, have the responsibility to continue to pray and, and appeal to the Father on their behalf that he interferes into their life. I know I'm pretty, my wife knows, I'm not to say harsh, but I'm not very, when I talk with my kids, I kind of probably make it difficult for them. <laughs> um, my wife has a better way of doing it. She just seems to be able to get to them easier than I can. At least it seems like. <laughs> uh, you just interpret it better. I interpret better. Oh, well, <laughs> see. That's what happens when you're... What your dad meant was... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anything else? No, that was it. I just wanted to make a comment about that because, they, you know, they have their own choice. That's right. And they do. it's... it's it is difficult, you know. We've told our children, you know, once they get out of their house and they're on their own, you know, not a lot we can say. But while they're in the house, you know, we've told them, we can't make you do the right thing. Right. But what we can do is show you the consequence of doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Okay? So. She has something to say here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Actually, what I was going to say was it's a blessing that we're not going to be punished for the sins of our parents because I do have parents that don't want anything to do with the Lord. In fact, my mom's on the other side of the fence. And so I'm grateful that we can, we can make that choice to come to the Lord and learn about him and have him in our life and not be punished by the things that they do. And by doing what's right in his eyes, in that way, you honor your father and your mother. Okay? Yeah. Thank you.
That's right. All right, John, are you ready, sir? Yes, sir. What, what great wisdom do you have to impart to us today? Well, I promise it won't get in Genesis 6. How's that sound? <laughs> <laughs> um, you do know what you started, right? I'm sorry, brother. <laughs> it went on for a few days. In, Genesis, in Deuteronomy 12, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> didn't go to 6. <laughs> Deuteronomy 12 uh, says a couple of places in 5 and in 14. Uh, I'll start reading in 5. Seek the place where Yahweh your Elohim chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place. There you shall enter. There you take your Olah, your, your sending offerings. Basically all the offerings. They're mentioned there and in 14. Except in the place where Yahweh chooses and one of your tribes. There you take your Olah sending offerings and do all that I command. I've always heard this is the tabernacle, the temple. That's the approved place. But then we get uh, into Judges, and we see Gideon uh, doing an offering out in the middle of nowhere. We see Manoah doing the same thing. We get into Kings. We have Elijah up on Mount Carmel doing an offering. These are all Olah whole burnt offerings. You could argue that uh, Jephthah did the same thing. You could argue David did the same thing. And they all seem to be accepted. They all seem to be approved, but they're not anywhere near the temple. So what do we make of that? Is the place he chooses just that, the place he chooses and not necessarily the temple? I mean, that would seem to be the default position. We've got evidence that it's not always that way. I don't know. I've kind of, you know, stumbled over that a few times myself. Um, I do believe that, you know, central to this command about the place that he chooses. Hey, Nate, can you get your head out of the way? I'm trying to make... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I was trying to look, I was trying to talk to John, but I was looking through your head. All right. Anyway, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah. All right. I, I, I do believe that central to the command is the, the notion that people aren't just supposed to go out there and fire up something willy nilly. You know, I, I do believe that that is there. You know, in fact, um, there is a passage in my brain's trying to shut down on me that basically says if you go and do that, whatever you offer on that altar will be like offering to demons. Okay, and I, and I think that it has a lot to do with what we see in Acts 15 when, you know, the letter goes out and it tells them to abstain from the pollution of idols. I think it's connected to that idea. You can't just worship in the way that seems right to you. So I do believe that that's embedded in that command. Now, as far as the, you know, the nitty gritty of it, as far as where it was, if it was Jerusalem, it was the tabernacle, but then you got all these examples you listed. There's a couple of those examples you, you mentioned where an angel shows up. <laughs> all right, that's a powerful <laughs> statement right there, okay? But then there are some where an angel doesn't show up. Elijah repaired the altar. So my thought is, okay, there was an altar there before, right? All right, so we get into that. But anyway, to answer your question conclusively, I can't because I've kind of stumbled over the same thing. And so I have to go back to the default position of geographically, it might not necessarily be one place. But the whole idea is, and I believe this is sound, that I don't just go out and start up something however, whenever, wherever, and do it the way that I think you should be done. That's what Jeroboam got in a lot of trouble for, right? He set up altars in Dan and Bethel, the golden calves, and said, these are your gods, O Israel, that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And why was he doing that? Because he didn't want them going down to Jerusalem to where, you know, the people were to congregate, where they had been commanded to go up here before the Lord. So that gets into motivation, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, you know? Um, again, why th these others were allowed, the places, I don't know. It, it's, you know, I've, I've said this a million times, you know, if I don't want a fly to get in my mouth, I keep it shut. So I'll just have to leave it at that. But I do feel strongly that there is a principle there that do it his way. Don't do it your way.
All right. All right. Thanks, John. All right. Nate, I'm sorry. <laughs> he's, light, he's light on his feet, isn't he? I, uh, I have... Oh, you started something, too. I have a choice for you. You have a what? A choice. I have a story that includes raisins and one that does not include raisin content. Seeing that I don't particularly care for raisins, let's go for the other one. Okay. Did I just choose death? No, I don't know. No, no. Know. They both come from today's... Okay, all right, very good. All right, good. I couldn't believe what I was reading, but it's actually in there. So instead, we're going to go with the boring one. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Oh, wait a minute. Let me think about this. No, Maybe fine. I didn't consider long you enough. Chosen. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 14, he retells clean and unclean meat, right? 14.3. Okay. I thought that was interesting. Maybe go back to the original time because we know that the Deuteronomy is the second telling. Right? So Leviticus 11. Yes. And so I was wondering first, how long is it between... Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14, like time-wise, is it 40 years or is it? Um, I would say that it's 30s, 30s, okay, you know. Okay, so it's a whole... I, but, you know, I'm, you know, that's my guess. So I was thinking in, in 11, for, uh, Leviticus 11, when he first does this, in order for him to make it holy, kadosh, these are going to be things that we are not allowed to do, uh, to separate us. Not Perhaps we didn't know why, but he was just saying, you're going to do it this way when you eat meat, right? These are the things you're okay. permitted. So that means before the time he told this, they might have been eating some of those things, right? Maybe. Otherwise, he wouldn't have had to give this list, right? Okay, maybe. So I'm thinking about the guy... That's sitting there when this is first told and say, I really like stork, right? <laughs> like stork cheeks, you know, just with a this little bit of rice. This is the boring one, remember? You know, there's people probably that went in the reeds and caught the heron or the stork and their wife had stork. You know, they got two tents down. He eats that stork every Friday. I know that, right? And now God says we can't. So, you know, you imagine how many of that actually existed. Is there any rabbinical writings that talk about what their diet was like before the giving of the, the law? All right, so let me say this first. Yeah. Things were codified at Mount Sinai and reiterated here, but the law had always been in the sense that what was clean had always been clean, what, had, what oh, was unclean okay. had always been unclean. You okay. go back to Noah, he's told, take seven pairs of clean animals and a pair of unclean animals. So it was already established what was clean and unclean. Noah already knew that. So what I guess I'm getting at is oh, God's instructions had already been put out there. So then... So there was no stork eating. Well, I'm not saying that. Okay. Because he had to remind them of a lot of things after they come out of Egypt. And he had to remind them in Ezekiel 20, for instance to put away all of the abominations before your eyes and all the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So he doesn't have to tell them that if they're not paying homage to the idols of Egypt and all these different abominations, which could include stork. Yeah. Okay? Stork cheeks. So they had, I guess it's like this. In, in my mind, when they go down into Egypt, Jacob and 70 souls, they live a set-apart life. And this is, I'm kind of bouncing around here. But they live in Goshen. And Joseph told them specifically, um, they need to know that you are shepherds. Because Egyptians don't like shepherds. And what did that do? It kind of, it almost ensured they would live a set-apart life. And if living a set-apart apart life, a set-apart diet, a set-apart everything. You following me so far? However, when Joseph and that generation died, what happened? They began to spread out. And it says the whole land of Egypt was filled with them. Implying what? If they're, if they're filling the land of Egypt, they're, you know, they're, they're coming more, uh, more acquainted with the things of Egypt, the diet, the gods, the whole bit. And we have to believe that they assimilated into that somewhat. So, yeah, they may have been eating things that they should not. 
And so Leviticus 11 is, I'm going to return you, I'm going to take you back to, this is, you know, things your forefathers knew. All right? You need to eat clean. You don't need to worship these things. You don't need to do that. So, all right, sorry to do that, but that kind of brings us back up to the place. But yeah, I think that there was a, there's a lot of reminders he gives them. Shabbat, the feast days, all these things. So did I interrupt your question or did I answer your question? You answered it. Thank you. Okay. All right, so against my better judgment, I, I want to know what the raisin question is. Okay. <laughs> all right. Let's all turn to First um, Samuel 30. Today you brought up uh, a really nice verse. I, I underlined it. It's uh, in the sticky pages, as an old guy I knew used to say. Those pages we don't open all the time. But um, <clears throat> you said that David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Right? This was First Samuel 30. Tell me the verse again because I've, I've lost it. It's, uh, okay, 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. And he was distressed, right? So everyone's disturbed, and they, they, he thinks he might even get killed by his own men. Uh, and he strengthened himself in the Lord as God. Now, if we come down a few verses, we see somebody else strengthens himself in something else. I'm glad somebody asked. Verse 11. <laughs> <clears throat> then they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David. And they gave him bread and he ate. And they let him drink water. And it wasn't enough. Okay, what did he need? <laughs> and they gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. Thank you. <laughs> so when he had eaten, his strength came back to him. Raisins. For he had eaten no bread nor drunk water for three days and three nights. Remember Moses, 40 yeah, days, I remember. four nights. Yeah. So he must have needed two scoops of raisins. <laughs> well, well, I did say it was against my better judgment. Less raisins. I couldn't I'm believe get, it. I'm beginning to pick up on the fact that you maybe like raisins. You do. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I just want to uh, thank you and the congregation. Uh, we came from a lawless state of Washington, and we wanted a good congregation to attend, and we just really thank you for your uh, leadership and your, your uh, better judgment on, on, on running a congregation, because it's, it's a tough job. But uh, the, the question I have is you brought up the... Uh, Hold that mic a little closer, please. Okay, so you brought up where uh, Thomas says, you know, your Lord and God. And I believe that Yeshua is God, and he was the God of the Old Testament as well. Because he, he also mentioned at one time that... Uh, he's going to be the intercessor between us and the Father, and that uh, if you wanted, if uh, you that you've never seen the Father or, or God or or heard of Him, and so there's a there's so in my opinion, Yeshua is the God of the Old Testament. There's a lot more scriptures I come up with. But I just want to know your thoughts in that area. Yeshua said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Again, Yeshua didn't correct him on that. So I believe that. The mechanics of it, I have no idea. So I don't try to explain the mechanics of it, you know. Um, you know, people want to get into, well, if Yeshua is, you know, if he's, divine, then how, why is he praying to the Father, and how does that work? And the answer to that question is, I don't know. That's why I say, I don't understand, well, I don't try to explain the mechanics of it because I don't understand the mechanics of it, but I know it's true. I know it's fact, because this is where faith comes in. In fact, Yeshua said, 
more or less, Thomas, you believe because you didn't have to rely on faith. You had all you had to do is look, and your you know the nerve endings in your fingers sent the sent the signal to your brain that this is real. You can believe this. But he said, but the people who haven't seen, but yet they believe what you just said, that I am their Lord and their God, they're blessed. Why? Because they believe because it's in their heart. They're, they're motivated by faith. And so I believe that. Can I explain it? Absolutely not. Do I try? No. But I believe it. Yes. I believe that when we see... Just as Brian was alluding to with the Aleph Tav over here, when we see these things that are talking about Yudhevav, the Lord our God, you know that doesn't ex that doesn't exempt Yeshua from that. You know He is that. You know He is part of that. And 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 maybe I shouldn't even use that word part of that because that kind of wants to try to get into the mechanics of it. But He is that. So yes, I believe that. I don't try to explain how it works though. You know, for example, uh, in Genesis that talks about Elohim, that's a plural form of El. So there must have been, in a, like in John chapter 1, it talks about that he was the word created the earth or created. Yeah, he, John said he, in the beginning, was the word. The word was with God. Elohim. Mm -hmm. And the word was Elohim. So even John says he was with Elohim, he is Elohim. So, um, as far as the grammatical part of it and the plural and all those things, yeah, you know, be, be careful with that because there are several places that I can, we can go to that, you know, uh, well, we won't get into that discussion today. I'll just, you know, but oh. do I believe that? I absolutely do, unequivocally, unequivocally. I really believe it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we should worship uh, Yeshua as well as the Father. So. Well, I think that when we worship Yeshua, we are worshiping the Father. Right. All right. Thanks. Okay. Anyone else? Jesse. Good afternoon. How are you today? I'm doing well. I need you to hold that mic real close. Yes, sir. So I'm going to turkey back off of what he was saying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say camel back because that's unclean too. So, anyways. Um, <laughs> okay, come on. Keep going, Jesse. Okay. Keep All going. Right, so Keep going. Yahweh Yire. Um, and I don't know if this is something that you had said previously or if it was Brad. Um, but if you take um, that comma out of when Abraham told Isaac, Yahweh will provide himself, take out the comma, the sacrifice, that he was essentially saying that he will provide himself. The lamb. The lamb. Yeah. And then there was Yeshua. So when you were saying that he kind of took him out of time and actually showed him that, and then he rejoiced. Uh, I thought that was. I didn't hear that part. Where you said that he, he took him out of time, in a sense, and showed him okay. where he actually did provide himself the lamb. Right. That's amazing. And then also, um, what he was kind of, uh, I think what he was trying to allude to was when Thomas said, Lord and God, <sighs> lost my train of thought. <clears throat> He, he was showing that he was both Yahweh and the Lamb, that they were essentially the same people. Well, not really people, but... I know what you mean. Okay, now let me go back and ask you the question that I was going to ask you. Now, what, in your opinion, what do you think would have happened if Abraham did not, in fact, wasn't willing to go all the way to sacrifice an Isaac on that altar? Do you think that they, he would have taken that promise away from him? I'm really hesitant to get into hypotheticals. I w but I'll, I'll answer this way. I don't think that God would have chosen Abraham unless he knew that he was going to be the kind of person that was going to follow through all the way. Now, that's what I believe. Now, yeah, we still have choice in all of that, 
but okay, apples and oranges, you know, at least two times God tells Moses, and there might, been, there might be three times, but at least two, there's, God speaks to Moses and says, all right, move out of the way. I'm going to wipe these people out, and I'm going to raise up a nation from you, okay? Was God just somehow stunned and surprised that these people were doing these things? No, I don't think so. So what's going on there? There's something being demonstrated to us, that, you know, because Moses is willing, even though he kind of gets mad at these people too, and he wants to take their head off, when, when it comes right down to it, he steps into the gap and he intercedes on their behalf. And that is exactly why, I'm convinced anyway, that's exactly why Moses was chosen. Because this was a man who was meek, he was a shepherd, he had a shepherd's heart, and that's exactly why God chose him. Because that's what a shepherd would do. He would intercede on behalf of his flock. All right? By the way, there's a connection to Abraham in that. Because when God's ready to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah, in the five cities of the plain, what is Abraham doing? If there are 50 righteous, if there are 30 righteous, he's interceding. Will the God, will the judge of the whole earth, you know, do so? You know, he's interceding. So that shows you the heart of that man. You, you don't think the creator of the universe knew those hearts long before they're introduced to us and what was in there. Now, yeah, they had choices, they made mistakes, they had to go through things. But my, I guess my point is, is that God knew, in chosen, God knew that in choosing Moses, here would be a man who would step into the gap and intercede. And I believe the same is true with Abraham. He knew that when he called him, here's a man that through time and through the process of time and, you know, even learning through some mistakes, that this is a man that would not withhold anything. So, I... You know, I won't get into the hypothetical of what, it, what would have happened had he not followed through. All I could say there is God would find a way, right? God would we'll find provide. a way. You know, he's not going to be taken by surprise in any situation. God would find a way. This is going off in a seemingly different direction, but give me just a moment. I want to pull up a scripture here, see if I can find it real quick. Um, all right, Matthew 23, Yeshua is coming into Jerusalem in verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned them which are sent unto you, how often? I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. My point being, he's saying, I wanted to gather you. Now, what, what if they had responded in that way? What if he had gathered? What if they had been willing to accept him as the Messiah and the king? What if he had been able to gather them? Would Jerusalem have endured the things that they had to endure? All right? It would seem to me not. All right? And yet we've got all these prophecies that talk about what's going to happen to the Messiah and all these different things. And yet he's saying, I wanted to gather you. Now, is he just toying with us there? Or is it just that there's something that, you know, well, I don't think he's going to be, ta be taken by surprise. I don't think that there's going to be... Uh, a coincidence or an, a happy accident. He's got all these things under control, and he knows the hearts of his people, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So if they had been gathered unto him and received him as king, what do we do with all those prophecies? God would find a way. What if Abraham decided, I just can't do this? God would have found a way. All right. What if I don't do what I'm supposed to do? You know, what if Beth decided, Beth and I decided we can't do this, we're not going to do this? He would have raised up somebody else to do it. God would find a way. Right? He does. I mean, I, I know personally a, a lot of times, and I hate doing it, but I find myself doing it sometimes, is going back and trying to play out, well, what if I would have done this and then done that differently? And then I realized, well, then I wouldn't be where I'm at today. True. And I'd much rather be where I'm at today than True. anywhere else. Right. So, 
He finds a way. Okay. And, and one real quick question. The, is it possible that the, that us, and I put us as a broad term, those who don't believe that Yeshua is Messiah, do you think it's just because they're looking at something on the surface level and not going deeper into what the word says? Because, I mean, clearly with that saying that Yahweh will provide himself a lamb, and, and I know the children of Israel were looking for Yahweh to come down and save them, but he did. He just didn't do it the way that they thought that they were going to, but it was, in fact, him. Just he tabernacled in, in, in flesh, but they didn't see him as Yahweh. Do you think it was... What was the problem? Well, if I go and read what Paul says, it boils down to they just didn't have faith. They did. They lacked the faith to believe that he was who he said he was. Um, if I were to expound upon that, I would say that in a lot of cases, then and now, it's mental block. Their intellect won't allow them to go there because it doesn't make sense to this brain. And that's the whole thing about bringing Thomas up. You know, Thomas believed because his brain said it's okay. This is real. This makes sense now that I'm feeling, touching, seeing, right? But Yeshua makes it very clear that there are going to be a lot who believe that never saw him tangibly anyway, never felt the wounds, and yet they still believe. So how are they believing? It's not with this. It's with that. So that, that's what it boils down to. People who do not recognize Yeshua as Messiah, it has to do with this, not that. Or then I could say it has a lot to do with that and not so much this, all right? Let me take one from the live stream if I can. Uh, the blessing was spoken from Mount Gerizim and the curse from Mount Duval according to Deuteronomy 11.29. Is this why the Samaritans chose Gerizim to put their temple and worship there? I, I think that's a logical conclusion that they, they would be motivated by that since Gerizim was the Mount of Blessing. Uh, to say that, you know, emphatically and conclusively I can't, but that, that makes sense to me. But that's about the best I can do with that one. If someone has better information, they can be, feel free to chime in. Uh, where's the mic? Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I guess um, when it was a while back ago. But Hold your mic, the mic a little closer. Thank you. Um, we were talking about how, I guess, people were confused about how a, di <laughs> a divine um, would pray to you know, God, like Jesus okay. would All right. pray. All right. um, I guess I started to think about it, and I was like, okay, um, well, why did Jesus Christ come down in the first place? And it was so he could be the perfect representation of what we needed to be and how we are told to walk out um, like him and be like him. So I guess I guess you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's just something I I don't think I there's of. anything that needs to be corrected there. I would just add to it that it's also that he was representing the Father to us because he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So we see the heart of the Father when we, saw, we see what Messiah does. You know, how can a human being comprehend a being that has no beginning and has no end. There's no limits to his power and authority. How do we comprehend that? I can't. It's beyond my comprehension. And so to have a personal relationship with a being that I can't comprehend is a little difficult at times. I mean, have you ever been going through something in your life and you think, God, where are you? You know? So how do you have a personal relationship with a being who transcends the universe? But then that being decides, I'm going to take everything I am and I'm going to put it in a human form and I'm going to put it here, walking among people, eating, sleeping, and doing all the things that humans do, and yet he's not, you know, a human being in, in an exclusive way, Right? And they're going to see him, they're going to hear him, and they're going, he's going to identify with everything that you and I go through, and still he's going to do exactly what is right and holy and pure 
and untainted by the things of this world to demonstrate, number one, this is the heart of our Father being demonstrated to us. And it's also, as you said, the example of what he calls us to be. And he wouldn't call us to be something if he didn't give us the power and the ability to do it. And so he does that through the Messiah. Okay? Thank you. Very good question or comment. Just an observation. Yahweh knows and sees the beginning from the end. There's nothing he doesn't understand. He knew Abraham's response before the exercise with Isaac. So in other words, that exercise with Isaac was for Abraham's edification, Amen. Not, not to give Yahweh an answer. Yeah, I agree. And he knew when he called Abram out of Ur of the Chazdeen that he was going to call him to Mount Moriah. He already knew that. Which is why I say that when he called us out of Babylon, so to speak, he knew all the things that he was going to call us to in this day and time as well. Nothing takes him by surprise. Is it true Sarah's death was a result to hearing of Abraham's actions and offering up Isaac? If so, how did she not see and what God asked Abraham to do even after he gave her Isaac in her old age? Um, I, that's not recorded in Scripture that I can detect, although I know that that is a very common uh, idea in some commentaries, that she hears about this and she expires, you know, in fact... Uh, some of those commentaries go so far as to say that's exactly why Abraham got up very early in the morning because he's trying to get everything ready and out the door before Sarah wakes up because she knows he knows that she'll try to stop him. Whether that's actually the way it happened or not, I can't say for sure. Uh, can I see it? Yeah, I can see it. Um, but why didn't? If that is the fact, why did she not see in what God asked Abraham to do? Well, I don't know that. She was privy to what God asked Abraham to do. I don't know that I would make that assumption. So, I don't know. That's the best I can do on that one. Yes. Candace? Hello, Bill. <laughs> Hello. Um, I wanted to make note that this is my third year anniversary of being with Jacob's Tent. And in my journey of being here, I've had some really ups and downs, and I've had some frustrations at times. I think that's all part of growing. But I am so proud to be a member of Jacob's Tent, and this is my family. I don't have any other family. This is my family. And I'm just really happy to be here. And another, I wanted to make a comment about the Godhead because I have a brother that likes to beat me over the head with, he believes there's three gods in one. And I, you know, I'm kind of like you. I don't know how to answer it. And so I don't like to answer it. And so he gets really mad and he'll, he'll start texting me John 3:16 over and over and over again. And so to what I tried to tell him and what I would say to anybody about the Godhead. Yeshua didn't tell us to argue over the Godhead, how many gods there are or whatever. He told us one thing. He said for us to love one another. And that's what I want to do. I want to love my brothers and sisters. And some, that's, that's a big enough job. Thank you, Candace. Three years. Wow. Time flew by, didn't it? Yeah. Hey, Pastor, how are you? <laughs> Don't you play that with me. You know I'm talking. <laughs> I'm good, Peter. How are you? Great. Thank you for asking. So I'd like to preface my question with some historical points so that I can give some more context to the question. So... We know back in, in history, uh, since Constantine, um, there was an order of priesthood that was established, right? That was 
pretty much a far cry from what we would read in the Book of Acts, right? And hopefully I'm not exaggerating by saying that. But um, so from the time of Constantine, we, we go, we get to the 1054, the great, what we know as the Great Schism, where there was a split and the Eastern Orthodox was established in the Roman Catholic Church to the West. And as time went on, the Eastern Orthodox, as we know today, has its own unique order of priesthood, just as the Roman Catholic Church has its own order of priesthood. Now, they may have some similarities, but yet there's two different orders there, clearly. When we move about 500 years from the 1054, the time of Martin Luther, he he becomes now, you know, he the, the, the ref, part of the reform. He's uh, the main person that is responsible for the Reformation. He no longer considers himself a priest, and as a result of that movement, now you know we have what's now the Protestant-based church. So today, Christianity has evolved to three main categories: the Eastern Orthodox, the Roman Catholic Church, and the Protestant-based church. And I find it interesting that. The two branches, known as Eastern Orthodox and the, and the Roman Catholic Church, still refer to the, the priesthood. They, that's their titles, are priests. But after Martin Luther, right, we, we get uh, the Anglicans and then the, uh, uh, the Lutherans. And now from that point forward, they, they've come to be referred to as reverends or pastors. So <clears throat> now that, that those historical points are, are established, my question now is, well, there's two parts of the question. So say from the time you went from being a Pentecostal to the Messianic Hebrew roots, which was years ago, right? Your, your beliefs and, and your doctrinal and theological beliefs, I'm sure have been refined from the time you first entered into this movement from where you well, are that's now. That's one word to describe it, yeah. Okay, beautiful. So. The thing is, is that the, the, the topic of the Melchizedek priesthood, right? We go back in the, in the time of Moses in Mount Sinai, Israel was originally supposed to be referred to as a nation of priests. And then we get to Peter, you know, 1500 years later, writing in his letter that now through Yeshua, we're an established royal, we're a part of the royal priesthood. Okay. So the question is, is, what do you believe in terms of the, the, the priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood? Do you believe from the time that you came into this movement, where you are now, do you believe there's a deeper sense of understanding and application of the Melchizedek priesthood? And do you believe that there's something further more and deeper that we are to discover? Just like when you first came into this movement, You've, you've gone deeper into certain topics and you've gained greater understanding. Do you believe that, that there is an order of the priesthood that we are yet to discover? I will say yes to that. But, you know, where I'm going to live right now is that when, when Peter quotes, more or less quotes Exodus 19, when he says you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and here's our purpose, to show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So I think that every one of us needs to embrace the idea that we are all to serve as his priests. And as his priests, you know, we are to live set apart lives because we are representing people to him and him to people when we encounter them. As to the uh, depths, I guess maybe I will use that word, of what in the Mel Melchizedek priesthood gets into, uh, yeah, I think there's probably a lot more that's going to be revealed, okay? Um, but for now, where I'm going to live is, as a royal priesthood, here's our mission, to show forth the praises of him who brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light, to, to live a set-apart life that is pleasing to him. When we get start getting into mechanics and how that's all going to play out in the kingdom, I'll leave that for the Messiah to give me instructions straight from his mouth because there are a lot of things that I don't understand, maybe because they haven't, it's not yet time for them to be revealed, but 
plain and simple, I don't understand. Now, I know that there are some people out there who feel that they do, okay? But um, I, I'm going to keep my focus on what I know as a priest I need to do. Show forth the praises of him who's called us out of darkness and delight, you know? And live a life that's exemplary according to his word, you know? Show forth these good works so that they praise your Father in heaven, those kinds of things. You would agree when Yeshua said that you receive not because you ask not. And then uh, when he says that uh, you, you're, you're called to ask, seek, and knock. So it, as we continue moving forward in this, this amazing movement that we're a part of and we're privileged to be a part of, uh, the more we ask, seek, and knock in prayer and fasting, you know, again, referring to Peter, pri uh, prophecies of no private interpretation, right? And so, okay. right. And so I, I believe as, as we move forward, asking the, those questions, meditating on that prayer and fasting, it will be revealed, but in, in, a, in a way of unity. Yeah, well, it's when it's revealed in a way that brings friction, factions, and division. Then we that's when I step spirit. back and say, you right. know, I'm, this is not what I'm going to get involved with. And to be quite frank, this topic has been the subject of division, fractions, and factions, and division. So that's why I say right now where I'm going to live is we show forth the praises of him who's called us out of darkness. We are witnesses of the resurrected Messiah. Um, and if I function in that word, he can label me, he can label me whatever he wants. <laughs> and as we grow and as we mature in time, I think a lot of things that we don't understand today will come to light, but they'll come to light when they need to come to light. Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, there are certain things that I ask for. I don't have them and I don't, because I don't ask for them. But sometimes I don't ask for them because I'm not yet at the place that I need to. Right? Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Okay. So for me, and as in the position that I'm sitting in right now, at this point, I don't feel the need to ask for all the revelation on that particular topic. I've got more than I can handle right now, all right? But I do agree with you that in time, that that needs to be brought to light will be, okay? Yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm learning to be a patient guy. Yeah. The greater point to the, que to the question is uh, there was another gentleman out there who was uh, with the beard. He was giving a testimony how the, the, you know, the father's been blessing him and he's you know, uh, he's been able to save money, and, and, and that's a very encouraging testimony, right? And, uh, and, and those are the blessings we should be, be observing and witnessing you know, the moment we come into the deeper truths of Torah mm -hmm. through the Spirit, correct? But the truth of the matter is there are people in this movement that are still struggling and still uh, being defeated. And so, um, like you, there, uh, I was part of the Assemblies of God for a few years uh, throughout my journey. And there was a lot of emphasis in spiritual warfare, right, and, and the demonic realm, and praying with authority. And so, a great part of the question about the Melchizedek, the more we understand that, right, we, it's, it's pretty much, we don't have to, you know, uh, uh, yell and, and, and roll around and, and, you know, in order to, you know, exercise demons, we just show up. You know, we know our identity in Yeshua. Well, that that right. I agree with. Right. Yeshua didn't go around chasing demons right. and trying to pull up, you know, cover, uncover them, pull rocks and trees and bushes back to find them. He shows up, they, they manifest, and he said, shut up, get out, because he had that authority. And I believe that we, we have been given that authority. I don't know that we walk in that authority. Okay. Exactly. All right. Okay. But that is something I believe that we are growing into. Amen. All right. Amen. But here is, I think, a very, you know, very important element of that that really doesn't, on the surface, touch the Melchizedek thing, at least, you know, blatantly. We got to learn how to get along with one another, you know, in a community and learn how to interact with one another just on the basic day-to-day -day things, you know. Let, let's put it this way. In, in, it's it's uh, 1 Corinthians 2 or 3, I forget the chapter. Paul makes this argument. There's a lot of things that I'd like to share with you that are meat, but you're still fussing over the milk. Right. Okay? So if you're going to fuss over the milk, why should I give you the meat? So 
I'm going to suggest that the body, and, and particularly this Hebrew Roots movement, whatever you want to call us, for the longest time we've been fussing over the milk. And we haven't been ready for the meat. All right? So maybe what's going on here in this congregation and others that God is raising up is to get us to the place that we're no longer going to be so prone to fight over the milk so that he can start giving us the meat. Interesting. All right? Yep. Thank you. All right. We've got time for one more, and then we're going to take a break and let you stretch your legs and visit the the restroom, and then at five, we're going to come back and do Rosh Kodesh. And I have been, Tina was gonna say something, Nate. Um, I've been, got a text here that uh, Amy Pernak says that we will have check-in childcare during the Rosh Kodesh service. So if you have little ones that you want to check into the nursery between six months and three years, uh, as soon as we conclude this part of our day, then you can take your children to the nursery and then we'll come back in here about five o'clock for Rosh Kodesh. Tina? Peter, I was thinking about this subject and in fact, I have been exposed to the Melchizedek priesthood for a very long time and what I have seen so far is that people that claim to be walking in the Melchizedek priesthood are very, very arrogant and very dismissive of other people. And it strikes me as something that Yeshua would never do because he actually, as the head of the whole priesthood, he has shown how to walk humbly as a priest and literally what it means to be a priest is if we read the book of Leviticus it literally shows us that a priest is serving the main function of a priest is serving 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 that is what's happening here on Shabbat for example Bill is serving all day long he is working he is serving all of the staff is serving, they're working. Everybody you see participating in being camera or, or media or children's ministry, whatever it is, these people are working, they're serving. So for us to learn how to become priests, we first have to learn how to serve one another. We have to... And, and that starts with denying me, myself and I, what I want to do and start putting somebody else above myself and asking, how can I edify that person or how can I help this person or what can I do to make life for my spouse, my children, anybody in the congregation? What can I do to make life easier for them? How can I serve them? But doing that, I have to deny myself. In a congregation, that is nothing different. It's the same thing because we are a family. We have to deny ourselves to elevate the other individual to make sure the other individual is served. Yes, I might be on the back seat, but literally I'm not because I'm serving. And when we learn how to serve, we learn how to become the priest. We learn how to sacrifice. Oh, shocker, they were sacrificing in the morning and at night. They were bringing sacrifices on Shabbat. Hmm, interesting. Learning how to do that and learning how to serve one another, we will learn how to become a priest. And how can I become a Melchizedek priest if I never want to read the book of Leviticus and don't know how to function as a priest? That's a big no-no. I have to learn how to become a priest when I dive into these pages of this book and learn what it means to become a priest and how to serve. Yeshua served us all the way into the grave. He gave his life for me. 
the biggest sacrifice that anybody can do as he said himself for a friend to give us life for somebody else he did that for me he is the ultimate priest and the only way we can learn how to become priest is when we look up to him and do what he says and and function the way he functioned as the high priest amen thank you tina all right here's what we're going to do i'm gonna we're gonna take you just a break now i am gonna try to start right at five o'clock and we're gonna leave the stream going brandon we're not you know you can put something up on the screen or you can show them a blank stage however you want to do it but if you're on the live stream we're not going to cut away we're just going to stay here but i'm going to give everybody an opportunity to stretch your legs and you have something you need to tell me yes i did announce it already all right so yes amy says that we will have a nursery you can check your little ones in up to three upstairs right now uh, and then we're going to try to come back in here at five o'clock so if you need to stretch your legs go to the, visit the restroom do that right now but try to be back in here at five we're going to start as close to that as we can thank you
And we're going to try to get started here in just a, just a moment. All right, folks, if you will, go ahead, please, and take a seat. If you're staying, go ahead and have a seat. Appreciate everyone's patience and endurance. I know it's stuffy in here. But let's go ahead and have a seat. All right, let's, um, let's pray, and then we're going to begin our service for the new moon. First of all, let me just say, um, I realize that uh, it's been a long day, and I know that some of us are anxious to get home, but I hope that you, well, I appreciate you hanging out with us so that we can do this, because I really wanted to make sure that we start getting back into the habit of observing new moon together. And so now that we've kind of got our own place, even with all its warts and flaws, <laughs> we're gonna we're to get back into a, uh, I don't want to use the wrong word, but routine is what comes to mind. But we're gonna get back into the flow of things. So, Father, we thank you once again for all your goodness to us, for your compassionate ways, your mercy, your loving kindness, um, the way you challenge us to provoke us to to be better people to overcome ourselves so that we can be more like your son, Yeshua. And so in everything we do, Father, we pray that it will be pleasing to you, that it honors your name, and that Yeshua is lifted up. So what we do now, we present it to you as our childlike way of trying to please you and do what satisfies you. So let everything that is said and prayed, every, every word spoken, be, let it sanctify your name. And let it, with everything else you do in our lives, work to transform us and to conform us into the image of the Son of God. These things we pray in his name. Amen and amen. Isaiah 66, verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Shabbat to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. And so this evening, a few hours from now, we'll begin Rosh Chodesh Elul, which is the sixth month. This particular month is mentioned in Scripture by name on occasion, and one of those times is in Nehemiah. And it, this is when the walls of Jerusalem were being restored. So in Nehemiah 6, verse 15 and 16, it says, So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. And it happened when all our enemies heard of it, and all the nations around us saw these things, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes, 
for they perceived that this work was done by our God. And so, as it relates to the month of Elul, apparently the Creator determined that that would be the time that they would, they would rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And what I liked about that passage is that the enemies of God's people were disheartened because they were able to see, they were able to perceive that what had happened had not been the works of men, but it was the work of God. And so may it be that everything that this congregation is connected to, that men will never see a man or a group of men being the ones responsible, but that they would always have to stand back and give glory and honor to God for these things that he has done. Amen? It was on that day that the prophet Haggai delivered a command to rebuild the temple of God. That is uh, on the same day of Elul. And I bring that out because the rebuilding of the temple was necessary. The reason Nehemiah had to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and the temple is because at one point Judah, has been <clears throat> Judah had been taken into captivity. So then the rebuilding of the walls, the rebuilding of the temple was evidence of not only the consequence of their past sins, but more importantly, it was evidence of their repentance. <clears throat> it was evidence of forgiveness and it was evidence that God was among them. And so those things that are built, those things that are restored, those things whereby the enemies of God have to stand back and say, this is the handiwork of the Almighty, those are, excuse me, that is evidence that God is among his people. And may it always be that there is no doubt that God is among us here in this congregation. That has to start at home. And going back to something we were speaking about in the Midrash, the adversary would love nothing more than to destroy my home, your home, my family, your family, that family, and he's really good at what he does. And so we have to be steadfast to defend not only this congregation, but even more so our families. You know, Nehemiah built or rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, how? with a tool in one hand and the weapon in the other. Why? Because there was continual adversity. There was, the adversary was always trying to find a way to get into the midst of what they were doing to subvert it, to undermine it, and to destroy it. And so we know we have an enemy that is going to be every day trying to figure out a scheme, a plot, a plan as, how, as to how he can get into our homes, into our families, destroy our lives, destroy our relationships, and tear those families and this congregation apart. And I'm not trying to glorify anything the adversary's trying to do. It's just pointing out the obvious, which means that we have to, as we build, keep a weapon handy. And the greatest weapon we have is his word, to use it, speak it into our lives, our families' lives, and to just be better about that. So, Haggai speaks of the rebuilding of the temple and how that it was evidence that God was among them. And it should also be pointed out that they did this in the midst of some very stressful circumstances. But it's also important to point out that Haggai mentions a latter temple. He says the glory of this latter temple will be greater than any of the temples that have come before. And I personally believe that what he was talking about is, well... Not necessarily a temple of stone and wood and those things, but I believe that that latter temple that's going to outshine all the rest, if I can use that, that term, is this living, this temple or this spiritual house of living stones that Peter talks about, how it's being built up. You and I, God's people, being assembled and put together to, have, to build a house in which his presence dwells. So he can't be contained Solomon prayed, you can't be contained by the heavens and the earth, and so how should we build you a house that can contain your presence? But what he's always desired from the beginning is to dwell in this house, to dwell in that house, and then collectively to dwell in an assault. And I believe that that is the temple whose glory will surpass all of the previous temples, that, that spiritual house made up of these living stones. So then... Moving on, the word Elul, it's very similar to an Aramaic 
root word that means to search. And so this month begins a time of teshuva, when we are beginning to look ahead to the holy days, Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, all these things, and we, we recognize the importance of all that. But before we even get there, we need to start now on gearing our hearts and minds for those days. So we enter into this time where we are to search our hearts so that we can draw closer to the Almighty, because we understand that Yom Teruah is coming. And yes, it's a day of blasting trumpets, but it's also regarded as Judgment Day. Judgment Day is coming. There are some things that are coming, and we want to prepare our hearts that we can hear and that we can respond to the Word of God. And let me go ahead and say this now. We, we talk about this from time to time in kind of a tongue-in-cheek tongue way. But by the time we get to Sukkot, which is the season of our... It is not the season of our airing all our dirty laundry. It is not the season to bicker and debate about this, that, and the other. It is the season to come together believing that the Father will meet us and he will be with us and he will encamp with us. He'll walk in the midst of us and it's supposed to be a time of celebration and joy. That means now is the time to deal with all the stuff. And this, these next several weeks, that is the time to search our hearts, to make amends, to do what needs to be done to make things right, to get all of this stuff worked out so that when we go into camp together, that it is the season of joy and not mourning and lamentation and all these other things. So we're gonna be hearing that more, more of that from, from myself and from Beth and from others, that now is the time that we turn our hearts back to him, we work out all of these things that need to be worked out because we know that this season of joy is upon us. And so as we turn our hearts back to him, it's customary to sound the shofar. And of course, the shofar and that sound, the voice is to awaken us from our spiritual slumber, to inspire us to turn back to our Father with all of our hearts. So in Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7, it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. There's a lot of Jewish tradition about Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur and all the things that are related to that as it relates to the last days. I think everybody here understands we're living in the last days, right? Raise your hand if you believe we're living in the last days, all right? So what should the focus be if we're living in the last days? What the Antichrist is going to do? No. What the Messiah is doing, all right? And we want to maintain that focus, and especially as we come into these holy times of the year. And so that'll bring me to the next point. The word Elul in Hebrew is akin to a word that means nothingness. And so the idea there is that we are to empty ourselves, our will, our desire, exactly what Tina was talking about just a moment ago, learning to serve, saying no to self, to prefer our brother before others until there is nothing left of our will. I will tell you, unfortunately, I have not arrived at that point where there is nothing left of my will. I know there's still some of it left. And I know that most of you cannot relate to that, but I just need to be honest with you. But I do, I desperately want to be someone that's described in the book of Revelation where it says they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives even unto death. And the reason I want to be that kind of a person is because that is the kind of person that is going to overcome the adversary in these last days. And it seems to me nothing short of that's going to work. So we all need to be people who want to be empty, that there is nothing left of our will only filled with his purpose and his spirit. And it's one thing to say it. It's another thing entirely to do it. And so then, 
that leads to my concluding thought here that if we are willing to empty ourselves, then we come to realize that without him, we are nothing. That without him in the midst of us, this is just another exercise in religion. And if that's all it is, it'll run for a little while, but eventually, if, if that's all it is, it'll fizzle out just like every other exercise in religion. And that's not what we want, right? We don't want just another church. We want a true, meaningful, purposeful, intimate relationship with the Almighty. And so that is going to require us to do more tomorrow to empty ourselves than what we did today. And the day after that, to empty more of ourselves than we did the day before, continually, until that time that we see Him face to face. And so at this time of year, it is a custom to recite Psalm 27, and so I'm going to ask you, if they'll put this up on the screen for me, Psalm 27, that I want you to recite this with me. Um, if you don't mind standing, I would like for you to stand. If you need to sit, I understand. It's been a long day. But let's recite this together. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me, he shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me, nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my mother and my father, excuse me, forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Amen. As I said earlier, um, if you had a prayer request that you wanted to write out, that you didn't want to share with everyone, I want to give you an opportunity at this time to come up and bring your prayer request. Also, even though we took up an offering this morning, it is our custom for those who are, have a willing heart and you want to do this, if you want to, to bring an offering specifically for the new moon, we want, you to, uh, we want to invite you to do that at this time as well.
You can be seated. In Philippians chapter 4, we're told to be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And so that's, what we, that's why we invite you to bring your prayer requests. I know that those of you who are online, you probably have prayer requests too. And by this time, I think most of you know where online you go to post those prayer requests, but you can do that on the app and you can do that on the website. So if you have prayer requests, um, share those on the app, share those on the website, and those will get to our prayer team. And I assure you that they will see those and they will be praying over those. It also says in Numbers chapter 28, verse 11, at the beginning of your months, you shall present a burnt offering to the Lord, two young bulls, one ram, seven lambs in their first year without blemish. And as I always liked to share with you, we don't have room for your bulls, rams, and lambs. And so we always invite people to bring an offering. And again, I know this is kind of a unique situation since we've, we've been here for Shabbat. We've, we've already received an offering. But there are people who want to do that specifically for the new moon, and we want to allow you to do that. Having done that, we are told that we are to blow the trumpet at the time of the new moon, at the full moon on our solemn feast day. For this is a statue for Israel, a law of the God of Jacob. This he established in Joseph as a testimony when he went throughout the land of Egypt, where I heard a language I did not understand. And so, congregation, will you help me recite from Psalm 89 when they get that on the screen? This begins, blessed are the people. There we are. Will you say this with me, please? Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. In your name they rejoice all day long, and in your righteousness they are exalted. And so I want to ask all of those who are going to sound the shofar to go ahead and assemble this time, please. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kitshanu bo mitzvotav, vetzivanu laashmoa kol shofar. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and has commanded us to hear the voice of the shofar. Amen. So now if the two gentlemen who are going to sound the silver trumpets would assemble, please. In Numbers chapter 10 and verse 10, it says, also in the day of your, glad in the day of your gladness, in your appointed feasts, and at the beginning of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and, and over the sacrifice of your peace offerings, and they shall be a memorial for you before your God. I am the Lord your God. 
I can't read this without always going to this, to, uh, to make this point, in that the things that we do, many times not really certain if we're doing it just exactly right, probably not doing it mechanically right, but having the heart of a child to do what is pleasing to him the best we know how until he enlightens us further, we believe that these acts of obedience to, in an effort to please him are exactly what he's talking about here, those things that will at one point come up as a memorial before him. And so these offerings, when we blow the silver trumpets over them, and I'm going to include also those of you who are joining us, at least symbolically, those offerings that you bring, those prayer requests that you have brought, we blow the silver trumpets over them as well, but believing that in the time that we need him to act on our behalf, in the day of adversity, when we need him to move on our behalf, that these, these good deeds, these alms, these things that we have done in an effort to please him, they come up before him as a memorial. Again, remember Cornelius. He was told that your, your prayers and your alms have come up before God as a memorial. And then what did God do on his behalf? He caused Peter to have a vision which basically set the stage for those men who would come to visit Peter, escort Peter back into this man's house, and so that he and his household would hear firsthand from Peter a witness to the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Messiah, would hear from his lips the testimony of these things, and that he would receive, he'd be the first, as far as we know, among the nations to receive the gospel of the kingdom, that good news, and in that day, non-Jews were brought into the house of Israel. That's moving on his behalf. And every one of us here have, maybe are, but certainly will have those times when we need, when we desire God to move on our behalf. And so then, we do these simple little things just in acts of obedience to please our Father, knowing that one day when we need him the most, He's going he's gonna to look at all these things that we have done in his name, and he's going to say, I'm going to act on their behalf. And collectively, he's going to do that one day when he redeems all of his people from all over the world. Amen? So then, sound the silver trumpets, please. I'm going to ask you to stand again, please. And I want you to join with me in reciting Psalm 67. God, be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Selah. That your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth. Selah. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Then the earth shall yield her increase. God, our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us and all of the ends of the earth. You may be seated.
All right. Still working the bugs out. Hine matovu manayim Shevet rachim gam yachad Hine matovu manayim Shevet rachim gam yachad Hine matovu Shevet rachim gam yachad When you get back to your seat, just continue to stand. All righty. So recite this blessing with me, please, if you will. Let me give you. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has kept us in life and reserved us and enabled us to reach this time. May it be your will, O Lord our God, and the God of our forefathers, that this month be filled with goodness and blessing. May you give us long life, a life of peace, a life of goodness, a life of blessing, a life of sustenance, 
a life of physical health, a life in which there is awe of heaven and hatred of sin, a life in which there is no shame or humiliation, a life of wealth and honor, a life in which we have a love of your law, a life in which our heartfelt requests will be fulfilled for the good. Amen. May he who performed miracles for our forefathers and redeemed them from slavery to freedom, he who sent his son to redeem us from the slavery of sin, may he redeem us soon and gather in the dispersed of his people from the four corners of the earth, the whole house of Israel, as one people. And everyone said, Amen. Yivorecha kadunava yishmorecha. Ya'er adunai panava lecha vichunecha. Yisa adunai panava lecha vichunecha. Lecha shalom. Bashim Yeshua HaMashiach. Sar shalom. Amen ve'amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace give you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom. In the name of Yeshua, the Prince of Peace, Sar Shalom. Amen. Ve Amen. A very early Shavuot Tov. Be blessed. Be safe. Go get cool. Amen. You're dismissed.